Chapter 4 All work and no play makes John a dull boy. He got dropped off at the top of Main Street. He knew there were at least a dozen different bars and clubs on Main Street, and he'd wanted to explore his options. He thought of the pubs he used to frequent back in England, but they were nothing like what he saw here. Here, everyone seemed to be having a good time. No one was throwing up in the street. No one was fighting with the police. No chavs yelling obscenities at passers-by. In fact, a real far cry from good old Blighty. Here were people from all walks of life. Just having fun. Not judging. Not discriminating. Everyone saying hi to everyone else. The first bar he came to had a dozen or so motorbikes parked in front of it. Mostly Harley Davidsons with a few Japanese sporty types there too. And heavy metal music coming from within. He liked the music, but the stereotype of the people made him feel a little nervous. Across the street from the biker bar was a tattooist. Nice placement, he thought as he smiled to himself and walked on down the street. He passed a few more bars before he found one he liked the look of. There were theme bars, businessman bars all full of suits and yawns. There was even a gay bar in the middle of it all and no one seemed to mind on any level. Such a far cry from what he had known most of his life so far. Eventually he found one that seemed to have regular people in it. A jukebox was in one corner with a small dance area in front of it. There were around 40 people or so in the place. Some stood at the bar, some dancing by the jukebox. Most were sat around the many circular tables in the place. As he weaved his way toward the bar through people and tables, several of the patrons made friendly gestures. He smiled and nodded back. When he got to the bar, he was greeted by an attractive blonde barmaid with a big smile. Howdy, stranger. What can I get you? She said. He looked at the barmaid and she was indeed very pretty in her Daisy Duke shorts with a fits where it touches and touches everything type top and plenty of cleavage on display. Excuse me, I'm up here, she said, still smiling as he raised his line of sight to make eye contact. He blushed and said, I, um, sorry, I, I, I don't normally, it's just, Oh, sorry. Oh, wow, you're English, she beamed. I've never met a real Englishman before. What can I get you? Can I get a pint of lager, please, he said. We have bottles of jugs here, honey, she replied. He blushed again and fought to not lower his eyes back to her cleavage. Her eyes flashed as brightly as her smile. Wow, a gentleman as well as cute. This must be my lucky day. What would you recommend, he asked tentatively, desperately trying to hide his shyness. Oh, honey, I can't answer that one, she said, at least not while I'm working. She winked at him, and those eyes and that smile flashed brighter than ever. I'll just have a bottle of bud for now, please, he said. She served him his drink on a tray with an empty glass and a coaster. He paid her, tipped her, and thanked her then found himself an empty table in the corner opposite the jukebox. He sat quietly watching the other patrons enjoying themselves, and he found himself smiling as if their happiness was contagious. He enjoyed two more beers over the next hour, and was considering moving on to another bar, when the pretty barmaid from earlier appeared at his table with a jug of beer and two empty glasses. She had changed and was now wearing full-length jeans with a looser-fitting, more conservative T-shirt. Hi there, she said. My name's Ellie May. Can I buy you a beer? Um, thank you. That, that, that would be nice, he replied. He stood up and took the tray from her and placed it on the table and pulled out a chair for her. Please, he said, take a seat. 
Oh, wow, you really are a smooth one, ain't you? She said, as she sat. I'm not trying to be smooth, he protested. I'm merely showing proper courtesy to the first lady I have met properly since my arrival in this country. This time it was her turn to blush a little. Well, thank you, she said. Your words surely are beautiful, and I just love your accent, but I ain't no lady. I'm just Ellie May. As they drank their beer, they exchanged more details about themselves. She was Ellie Mae Franklin, 34 years old, born and raised in Texas, single, never married, no children, no boyfriend, never went to college, never travelled out of state. Everything I could ever need is right here. Why on earth would I want to leave? He in turn gave her an abridged version of his breakup and a truthful account of his childhood and his life in England, conceding that until now he too had never travelled. He told her about his family, all now deceased, and what it was like growing up as an only child. She in turn told him about her family, all still living, and what it was like to growing up as the middle child of seven siblings. As it got nearer to closing time, she asked if he was staying in town. When he told her about the farm he had rented, she exclaimed, That's near 12 miles away! He explained that this was not an issue, as he would simply get a taxi. At this, she exploded with laughter and said, Oh, honey, you're not in the city now. I don't know how it works in England, but around these parts, all the taxis are done for the day by 11 p.m., and the drivers are in the bar by five past. Most folks live within walking distance, and those that don't, well, heck, half of them drive anyway, drunk or not. He explained that he could not entertain the idea of drinking and driving, which is why he had left the truck at home and had arrived by taxi. The more you say, the more I like you, she said. You ain't like the men folk round here. All they thinks about is themselves and their trucks, but you're, but you're not like that. Is there a bed and breakfast or a hotel here in town, he asked. Oh, sure, she said, but it's gone midnight, so they'll have gone to bed by now. There's a motel about four or five miles north of here, but that's in the wrong direction for you, and that's five miles out, and that's a heck of a walk at this time of night. Then it is a long walk home from me, he said, but it's all good. It'll take a few hours, but for sure, but it's no big deal. Don't worry. I'll be fine. Look, she said, now, I'm not in the habit of inviting strangers into my house. But I like to think I'm a pretty good judge of character, and I think I'll be okay with you. The simple truth is that I have a spare bedroom at my house. In fact, I have two. And I would feel a lot happier, and you would be more than welcome to stay tonight at my place and get yourself a taxi home in the morning. They're usually up and running by 8 a.m., but you wouldn't have to be obliged to leave that early if you didn't want to. I generally work the late shift because I don't have a husband or kids to get home for, so I tend I tend not to rise until about 10 a.m., and then I'd be happy to have breakfast bef with you before you have to head out, that is, if you want to. John had heard of the fabled Southern hospitality many times over through years of film and television. But he had always he had always assumed that it was made up like an urban legend. Now, experiencing it firsthand, he was a little taken aback, and he sat there in silence for a moment while he processed the words that he had just heard. Oh, my God, I said the wrong thing, she said apologetically. I'm really sorry if I have caused offence. John raised his hand in a calming gesture and said, No, really, you've said nothing wrong. And if you are sure it won't cause you any inconvenience, I would be happy to accept your kind offer. I am sure, she beamed, but I do have a favour to ask in return. Name it, he replied. Before we turn in, can we just sit a while and talk? It's not often that I get company at home, and really you do have such a beautiful way of putting things, and I love your accent. She blushed a little at her own words. 
it would truly be my pleasure to provide you with company until you wish to retire, said John. Then that's settled, she said. We'll finish our beers and we'll head for the hills. Ellie May's house was about five minutes walk from the bar and it stood in line with about 20 others that all looked similar in the dark. Typical wooden frame structure with a semi-enclosed front porch area. He believed they called it a stoop. She unlocked the front door and went in first to turn the light on. Come on in and shut the door, it's chilly out there, she said, as she headed through towards what he assumed would be the kitchen. I always have a hot chocolate when I get home, she said, as he heard pots and pans moving around. Would you like one? If it's not too much trouble, I, I, I would prefer a black coffee with a couple of sugars, he replied. No trouble at all, if you don't mind instant, she said. Instant is fine, he said. Well, you sit yourself down and I'll be in in a few moments, she said. Make yourself at home and feel free to put the TV on if you want. Five minutes later, Ellie May came back into the living room, carrying a tray bearing two steaming mugs. Gone now with the jeans and T-shirt, and now she was wearing pale blue pyjamas with white clouds on them and a big fluffy white dressing gown. In a completely non-sexual way, John had a strong urge to hug her. She looked warm and safe to him, and he became acutely aware of how much he was missing physical human contact. But he suppressed these feelings with very little effort. He was first and foremost a gentleman, and it was easy to show courtesy to a woman. In his mind, however, they were sharing an embrace that chased away his loneliness. He smiled outwardly, and she noticed. Hey, you laughing at my PJ, she said with mock sternness. This time there was no embarrassment from when John replied. Not at all, he said. I was merely smiling because I'm feeling happy. He sipped his coffee and complimented it accordingly. Now you're just being nice, she said. No one really likes instant coffee, unless they never tried the real thing. They chatted for an hour or so about this and that. She asked him about all things English, and he in turn allowed her to educate him on average daily life in this part of America. Ellie May yawned, and John instantly said, You look tired, and I am just keeping you up. I should let you get some sleep. She half-heartedly tried to protest, but she knew he was right. I'll show you where everything is, and then I'll turn in, she said. That's okay, he said. If you point me towards the bed, I too am very tired, and you have been the perfect hostess. Oh, nonsense, she said. I only made you coffee, and then I talked your ears off for over an hour. Truly. You have given me the most enjoyable evening I have had in a very long time. You have shown me kindness and generosity. You have opened your home to me, and you have been the most charming company any man could wish for. In short, the perfect hostess. You really do say the most beautiful things to a girl, she blushed. Are you sure you're not hitting me, hitting on me? I'm just kidding, she added. I cannot say in all honesty that I am not attracted to you. You are a very attractive lady. And now, having spent time in your company, I find your personality to be as lovely as your looks. But I am not, as you put it, hitting on you. He closed his eyes for a moment, and ever so briefly, the universe held its breath for him. When he opened them, Ellie May was looking slightly perplexed. You do that a lot, she said. Closing your eyes, that is. My mum always told me that it means you're trying to hide your sadness. Please don't take offence at that. I know what it's like to feel lonely. And you act a little bit like I do when I try not to show it. He had no words to respond with. 
every fibre of his being was locked on one solitary thought. No tears. Not now. Not here. He held eye contact for as long as he could. Ellie Mae smiled at him and said, I do that as well. He looked quizzically at her and she continued, Try to free time so I don't cry in front of people. I think I am a little drunk and a lot overtired, said John weakly, but he knew she could see through the lie. So if you would be kind enough to show me where I'm sleeping, she cut him off mid-sentence. Would you stand up, please? Because I'm going to hug you and you can't say no because it's my house. Really, there's no need again, she cut him off. I said, you can't say no. And I said, please, too. Slowly and silently, he stood up and she moved closer. Now you have to hug me too, you know, she said, and she put her arms around his waist. He reciprocated the embrace and she hugged him tightly. It felt like the embrace lasted for hours, but in truth, it was only a few seconds. He was lost at sea, and there was a storm erupting in his head. His loneliness was basking in the close contact of another human being. His rage was reminding him why he was here. He was feeling scared and elated all at once. Then she let him go and stepped back. Now you just try and tell me you don't feel better for that. Again, that beautiful smile erupted across her face. I cannot, he said, for it would be a falsehood. One single tear escaped and ran down his cheek. He instantly removed it and felt a little annoyed with himself. Ellie May walked him through the house and stopped at the first door. That's the bathroom there, she said. And the next door along is my room. You can have the room opposite mine. It's already got the bed made up. As they went to their respective doors, Ellie wished him a good night. Ellie May, he said, as she turned to face him. He took her hand and kissed the back of it. I owe you a debt of gratitude. I am so glad to have met you. She trembled slightly at his touch and sighed, a little whimper of appreciation. They parted into their separate rooms and closed the doors. He found sleep surprisingly easy on this night, and he dreamt of Ellie May. <laughs>